take one. Hello and welcome to the Studio Rat HQ podcast. This is podcast uh, number seven or number eight, depending. Um, and today we're going to go back into the time machine and talk about an album from 1978. But uh, as you may Mr. know... Peabody set the Wayback Machine for <laughs> exactly. Malibu, California, 1978. And as you may uh, know, my name is Stephen Couch and I am here with Richard Kaplan and Derek Jablonski. But we also have a special guest with us today. His name is Bart Johnson. And one of the main aspects of this whole podcast is we are talking about albums that were recorded at Indigo Ranch Studio in Malibu, California. And one of the reasons Bart is with us today is because he worked out there with Richard at Indigo. How are you doing, Bart? I'm great. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to Olivia Newton-John pretty quickly. Um, a couple of things, a couple of pieces of business to take care of. We are on youtube.com forward slash Studio Rat HQ. That's where you can find all of these podcasts with audio and video. We also have um, audio at studioradhq.com via Podomatic. So if you want to download or listen to the audio of this podcast, you can do so at uh, studioradhq.com. Also, please like and follow us at Facebook. We have two main Facebook pages. One is facebook.com forward slash studioradhq, but also a lot of activity if you search out R.I.P. Indigo Ranch. Um, most of the photos of pieces of equipment and things that we talk about are posted on the Facebook page. So, Bart, how did you get involved with Richard at Indigo Ranch Studios in Malibu? Well, it, it goes way back to uh, connecting up with uh, Richard in Minnesota, uh, which is uh, where I'm from. Uh, he, I, and a, a Another uh, friend, Gary Dale, uh, were working together doing light shows and um, you know, industrial uh, lighting systems and control systems and so on. For like and, rock, for like rock concerts, or uh, yeah, that would have been uh, you know one aspect of the business. Yeah, we we covered I've a lot. Got a of whole work. series of posters that, if you wanted, we could post uh, with some of the bands we work with, like the sure, Birds yeah. and uh, yeah, Johnny awesome. Johnny Winter and. Uh, uh, Frank Zappa, and uh, it just went on and on and on. Okay. All right, Bart. So you're working with Richard on lights. Then what happens? Uh, I think, you know, um, I remained in Minneapolis. Richard eventually moved back out to Los Angeles and hooked up with the Moody's and uh, was off to England. Uh, I eventually, years later, made my way out to the West Coast uh, when... Uh, Indigo Ranch was up and mostly running. It was more or less a private studio when I arrived in, I think it was uh, the end of 75, beginning of 76. It was just transitioning to uh, a commercial facility at that point in time. You mean what, it was what the Bob private... means by the Moody's is the Moody Blues, <laughs> who were the original partners in Indigo Ranch Studios. And after I moved back to Los Angeles, I then moved to England to be with the Moody Blues for 1974 and uh, uh, got back to Los Angeles and we built Indigo Ranch and uh, Bart and I reconnected at that point. But they kept it as their private recording space for what, two years or one year or what? A little over a year where a we were doing in-house, uh, we did Stephen Freelight, we did Michael Pender's The Promise, we did uh, bits and pieces of Moody Blues solo albums, and then along came our first client, Canned Heat. Okay, right. Awesome. Cool. And um, let's, let's kind of seep into Olivia Newton-John here. This album came out in November of 1978, so Indigo had uh, clients publicly for about two years, I take it, or... Um, Maybe about a year even, or what? About two years, wouldn't okay. you say, Bart? Yeah, two or three, actually. I think 76 is when um, things uh, really took off uh, in, the, in the studio world. 
All right, so one thing we do on this is we talk about in the time capsule the top five albums and the top five singles of 1978. Uh-oh. So let me, let me read them out to you guys just so Here you can remember. <laughs> top five albums of 1978. Number one was Saturday Night Fever, which was mostly Bee Gees compositions. Nice. Number two was Grease. Number three was Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. Awesome. awesome. Number four was The Stranger by Billy Joel. And number five was either Aya or Aja by Steely Dan. Those were the top five albums. The top five singles of 1978, according to the Billboard year-end Hot 100, uh, was number one was Shadow Dancing by Andy Gibb, which, oh, yeah. is, a, which is a BG kind of brother. Uh, Night he, was Fever. he was definitely a brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Night Fever, number two by the Bee Gees. Number three, You Light Up My Life by Debbie Boone. You do. Mm -hmm. Number four, uh, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. Oh, man. And number five was Kiss You All Over by Exile. So so basically that, disco was in? Disco was right at its peak. Yes. And let's, let's go to you, Bart and Richard. So what happens? Um, one of you or both of you receive a phone call from Olivia Newton-John's management or she shows up. What, what happens? <clears throat> the management got a hold of uh, my partner at the time, Michael Hoffman, and uh, wanted to book time for an album with Olivia. Had you guys met her before or what? No. Um, everybody, of course, had uh, um, some picture of who she was because of her notoriety with the movie Grease, which had just come out, and this was her follow-up album to that movie. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we very much look forward to seeing her, the legend. So, Bart, were you engineering full-time at Indigo Ranch in 78? My position uh, there, um, I was the electronics engineer. Okay. Say chief engineer. I really, you know, wasn't a musical engineer uh, per se. Uh, I typically limited myself to, you know, in terms of a session, typical sessions where I'd calibrate the machines uh, make sure all maintenance was done before a session, uh, stick around for the, the first day typically, make sure there are no hiccups, and then just kind of withdraw into the background unless there was you know, something that, that needed to be done. But in this case, there was a, a much stronger need for uh, you know, my presence there. Wow. This, was an er this was the era of the Jays in studio maintenance. We had Dean Jensen himself, Right. We had Jerry Jensen, uh, who was not related to Dean Jensen, uh, who was uh, a, a chief uh, influence on Indigo's electronics, and then we had Bart Johnson. So it was all Jays in the electronics department, <laughs> and this was a uh, an album where they brought in their own crew. I served three roles with three different, notice I'm wearing a different hat today, Yes. Um, and I served three different roles at Indigo. One was, of course, as a, a engineer, one was as producer, and one was just as studio manager, um, and I had come off of kind of a long stream of engineering roles and did not look forward to the... Um, kind of Hollywood pushy vibe that was seemed to be coming in with this album, although I very much look forward to meeting and working with Olivia. And since they were one of the few groups that brought uh, their, their engineer insisted on having his own speakers and his own tape machine brought up for the session, so we had to link it up into the Indigo system, which meant, of course, that we needed BART there much more of the time, much more hands-on, and um, who wouldn't want to have been in on Olivia's sessions anyway? So right, right. There, yeah. there, 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 there was a marriage waiting to happen. I was going to ask if, uh, if she had any particular... Um, items she brought into the studio, like if she only used a certain microphone, or we kind of go back a little bit on a previous podcast about how people bring things into the studio, you know, like a little, you know, maybe she only wanted flowers in there, you know, or maybe she had like a 
particular good luck charm, but I think that's pretty wild you're talking about someone saying, oh, well, I can only have this type of tape machine, which I, I can't understand why, honestly. What would be the reasoning to really bring their own tape machine? Bart? <laughs> well, it's old well, reliable. You know, you, know you, you, you could look at it from a couple of different, you know, standpoints. One, you know, there was obviously a lot riding on this album. You know, uh, she was at kind of the, the peak of her fame uh, at that point. Um, the engineer, um, Dave Holman, and John Farrar had worked together on Greece, I believe, and you know that he was talking literally about taking home wheelbarrows of money, and uh, I think he just wanted to make sure this one followed directly in the footsteps of that album. You know, uh, it, it, you could even look at like he didn't want to jinx any you know future outcomes, so he just wanted to, you know, be back in the groove with his speakers and, and his tape machine. Now that said. We did also use, uh, you know, the studio's 3M24 track uh, in that same session. We uh, had a synchronizer running, so it was actually a 48-track session. Oh, wow. In those days, the most dreaded thing in a session was having to have two tape machines synced together, and there was the, the illustrious Q-Lock, um, and then there was the Adam Smith, uh, and then finally, when uh, things started to get together where we were syncing two analog machines, we would use a link system. But this was in that early period where syncing two machines together was almost, uh, you know, voodoo, hocus pocus, right. uh, you know. Of. Wow, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> we actually got it to work. Well, now that you're talking about the um, kind of either the pressure or, or what they wanted to achieve, the album did very well. Um, it uh, had a couple of singles. One was A Little More Love, which was number three on the pop charts, uh, number 94 on country, and number four on adult contemporary. And then the other one, Deeper Than the Night was number 11 on pop, number 87 on country, and number four again on adult contemporary. So, did I? It, I'm, I'm sorry, real quick. Did I see yeah. a cover on that album? Did you see Give Me Some Lovin' was on there? Yes. Yeah, that's the Spencer yeah. Davis group. Yeah. 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 Um, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so, going back to um, the, the either the production process, one of the things I heard, is, is especially on the first track, which is called. Um, uh, please don't keep me waiting. Were mm -hmm. synthesizers and a vocoder? Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Uh, Our, well, I, what I'm remembering um, mostly from those sessions, I, I'm I'm not going to be able to directly answer you, but indirectly, okay. Okay. Uh, I, I recall uh, them using the Aphex Oral Exciter. Oh, wow. okay. significantly on that project. It might even have a credit. I, I'm not certain. Uh, and it was a real different sort of processing machine uh, um, billing system in that you, right. you they, they give you the, the item and you could use it for, for weeks and months and they only charged you by finished product time. Oh, wow. So, was, well, what did what, what what did it oral excite or what did it do excite certain frequencies or expand the? I remember Chris Brunt came along, who was also one of our uh, regular engineers at Indigo, and he said, "Let's see, you take a capacitor and a resistor and insert it in the signal chain, and you have an Aphex oral exciter." Oh, uh, okay. So it's just a little bit of now, boost here and there. What happened? The first time that we used the oral exciter was on a Neil Young project, and uh, I remember that you know they were so you know thrilled to have this device up at Indigo, <clears throat> and during one of the sessions, somehow or another, the oral excite the Aphex unit got unplugged, oh, but man. it was still working. What the meter the meters weren't working. But the sound was still working, and yeah. we realized at that moment that it was a passive device. And I remember going to the AES show and uh, uh, the Audio Engineering Society show to the Aphex suite upstairs and saying, hey, you know, I'm from Indigo Ranch, and uh, 
you know, we uh, we come to find out that you know the Apex works just as well unplugged as plugged in. Uh, <laughs> that which means you know you're charging an awful lot of money for a passive device. And I was picked up by the scruff of the neck, escorted from the room, <laughs> told never to come back. And oh, every Apex 19-inch rack mount unit was immediately recalled from the field and a relay was put in so that if it did become disconnected from the uh, plug-in AC, that the unit would switch off. Oh, well, the man. most famous, or I don't know about the most famous, but the Apex Twin is something that came along later, and I've used that. But um, there's also a, a, a kind well, they of... had a number of... Uh, uh, very good compressors. They had some EQs. Uh, what was his name? Baskin? Yeah, David Baskin. David Baskin, who was associated with them at some point, uh, designed some good compressors and equalizers. And they made some really good equipment. But the thing that put them on the map was this Aphex Oral Exciter. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's an artist, uh, he's an electronics, uh, electronica kind of. I don't know how you define him. He's in a genre all of his own, but he, it's, he's called the Apex Twin. That's his artist name, and he mm. he's pretty well known. Um, all right, well, another thing about this um, record is um, uh, Olivia Newton-John does not have a backing band, so these are all studio guys being called in, right? Yes. And so good, what, I mean, these were the top-of-the-line guys. Well, the budget's unlimited, I would guess, after Greece. You know, they were just like, whatever you need would be my guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would assume so. That. Sure it was. So, w explain to so the... why did they end up at Indigo? Um, no, no, I wasn't saying that. <laughs> Well, part of it was Olivia wanted to be there. Um, and, you know, a, a kind of against production ideas, she lived in Malibu... And she wanted a studio that was uh, close to home uh, versus having to drive into Hollywood every day. And the rest of the crew was all Hollywood regulars. Mm -hmm. And to them, it was a major inconvenience having to go to Indigo every day. And they kind of, in an ego sense, put them ahead of themselves ahead of the artist, okay. which I think was a fatal move. And uh, Why was that uh, fatal? Well, because uh, she got her way. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not confounded or anything, but I'm just like, why would a, a session guy say I'm more important than the star? I mean, I, uh, ego is what you're saying, but that's kind of surprising that you hear you well, got Well, because I think they had a bigger track record. Oh, okay. Even, uh, I mean, well, cer certainly the musicians who played on the band had hundreds of albums under their feet. And... Uh, you know, major albums got, you know, Steve Lukather, yeah, yeah. Uh, Boddicker, um, you know, the horn section, right. the, you know, I mean, the, these were like major players in the studio world mm -hmm. and driving 30 miles and, you know, five miles up in the hills and a mile of dirt road. This was, I mean, Bart, do you remember one day they had to do construction on the road and, uh, Olivia stopped her car on the far side of what was then a dirt road and walked in. Um, you know, this this was not some prissy little, uh, you know, typical female diva. This was, I mean, she was like the most real person I've ever met. Mm, mm. You know, yeah. just, she just, you know, dealt with the situation rather than complain about it, you know. Walked in, sat on the couch, and uh, you know, chit chatted, and uh, you know, waited for uh, her part uh, to be called into the studio, and then would go in and do whatever was necessary for her, and then would come out and uh, you know, sit and chat, and was like super friendly and uh, just you know, a dreamboat. So, so well, unlike a lot of your other artists, she didn't um, bring like a whole entourage with her. No, I, I always remember her driving up alone in her, her white convertible. Her white Mercedes convertible. I knew you were going to say Mercedes for some reason. <laughs> I just felt it. Yeah. Well, well did, was she there um, for all the sessions when all the backing musicians were doing their parts? or in, And did she have a say-so in that? Or was she sort of, like you said, sitting on the couch waiting for her moment? Or 
boy, this is where I al always, with every one of these uh, podcasts, say this is a mixture of fact, fiction, <laughs> and 35-year-old memories. Yeah, yeah, oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember her being there an awful lot. Okay. Bart, uh, what, is, what is your take on that? Yeah, I. she was there for the critical decision stuff. Um, you know, I don't think John uh, Farrar went too far without, you know, getting input from her. You know, they were, they were definitely working as a team there. Yeah, and by that time, she had already had, what, like, she put on, she had a release every year in the 70s, except for 79. So wow. she already had a lot wow. of stuff under her belt. I'm pretty sure she would kind of know where she wa where where she wants to be. Yeah, well, when did Grease come out? Was that the same year or the year before? Does anybody know? At least a year before. Um, okay. Yeah, I have the listing for 78 for Grease. But also this for this out. album. So. Well, this came out in, in November, so maybe Greece was earlier in the year. So she was already yeah. July way way up there. And keep in mind, it doesn't come. It, it isn't like you f finish singing a song and a record comes out of a louver on the side of the console and is ready to release. There's a time lag. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I just um, like to know how she got on the whole Greece thing. Is what a combo! I mean, you can still watch that movie and still enjoy it. Still enjoy the, you know, the soundtrack and everything. So, she's a talent. Absolutely, yeah. Let, let's. That's a good point, Derek. Um, this this record is sounds of its time, you know. And one of the things I always I was always talking about with others a very distinctive factor in what sort of quote unquote dates a record are the drum sounds. Does it? Do you guys remember how they got those drum sounds, or what? What? Or just in general, talking, you know, to engineers that were were recording back then, what made '70s drum sounds, quote unquote, '70s drum sounds? <laughs> Want to take that part? <laughs> well, I think you're here. You're in a much better position. Now. You know, I just uh, comment, you know, that uh, I remember seeing the graphic equalizers in the console at Indigo. You know, swirled around where you're, you know, pushing the top end and pushing the bottom end and pulling out the middle. But, uh, mm -hmm. Well, they also yeah. have no kind of room sound either. Very sort of dead, um, no reverb, uh, which was also on some later albums in the '70s. But at least on this record, very kind of a, a dense. Uh, I don't want to say flat, but a, a very dense sound and. Of course, in the 80s, that changed, where oh, yeah. reverb, reverb oh, yeah. and high end, and then in the 90s, there was a completely different sound, and well, then today... Well, right right around the time this album was coming out, I mean, that was that was right around when you were transitioning from disco into, like, new wave. There was a lot of right. difference. I mean, not just this album, but if you listen to all of her albums, they are completely different, not only by yeah. genre, from adult contemporary to country, you know, to, like, new wave, but, I mean, th they sound incredibly different. They all sound so much different. Yeah, it just it, it blows me away. It just blows me away from album to album. Honestly, I don't even remember for sure what mics they used or or the drum set. I had worked with Michael Boddicker a number of times, and uh, I assume we used the the basic Indigo uh, drum setup at that time. Um, do you remember anything being unusual? Bart? No, no, I don't. I don't. I, I, I think they were using like an RE twenty inside the kick, and uh, um, probably either uh, that might have even been before we had our collection of four twenty ones. It might have been RE fifteens and sixteens on the toms, and uh, inside, inside the toms or on top of the toms. On top. Okay. I and believe. Room mics too, or what? Um, I vaguely remember a crossed pair of 452s above the drum kit. Okay. Uh, AKG 452s. Is, does that coincide with any of your remember, memories, Bart? Yeah, I was going to say 451s or 452s. Yeah, or... same, same basic thing. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> fairly simple drum kit. Now keep in mind, drums, you can do everything in the world, and 90% of the drum sound is still the drummer himself. Mm -hmm. And 
Michael Boddicker <laughs> had a extremely well tuned, well maintained set of drums on every session that he ever worked, and um, you know you could, uh, like Bart said, do the the typical uh, roll out of the middle and uh, uh, boost at the top and bottom to get that really uh, in your face kind of drum sound. But uh, Can you his drums were distinctively his instrument. Well, for for anybody. I, I think for anybody listening, drum, though, can you can sorry. you can you tell us a little bit more about you said boost the highs and the lows and take out the mids? Just for people who might be listening to this from like a kid in full sail or something who's kind of what what range are you talking? Well, j I think you're talking about Mike Botts, not Michael Boddicker. Michael Boddicker was since. Oh, excuse me, Michael Botts. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, okay. So go ahead. Sorry about that. But um, so talk about that. Uh, either Bart or Richard, what's the EQing scheme? that came to mind for you guys on those drums? Go ahead, Richard. Um, <laughs> I, I remember um, th uh, um, them following what was basically the indigo kind of drum sounds, which were pretty well established by that time. And with the EQs that we had, most engineers would come in and look at them and be like, uh, what do you do with these? Because they were thumb wheel, parametric kind of EQs with a lot of frequencies. And the, um, we would usually suggest rolling on the bottom two frequencies to a pretty extreme amount rolling out whatever sounded best somewhere between uh, 220 and 500 uh, cycles and then adding a bunch of uh, high end somewhere between 2k and 5k and maybe even higher up to give that carved out uh, where you're getting the distinct tone of the drum from the bottom end you're not interfering with the musical mid-range by having too much mid-range mm -hmm. uh, since it's all carved out mm -hmm. and you're getting the extreme uh, high end to give you the, the, the sound of the, the drum actually being hit by the stick or the beater. You know, um, one thing I have right here, I don't want to hold it up to the camera because it's got their logos all over it. But um, when I was continuing my education, I went to Full Sail. One of the cool things that we got was a frequency and instrument chart. And basically, it gives you a rundown of key frequencies to boost and cut to get different. <laughs> different. Um, yeah, I really want to hold it up. but I, anyway, I'll just give you an example. Um, there's one here, and it says, for Toms, it says, um, uh, to increase the attack, boost the 5 kilohertz. Or mm -hmm. for fullness, boost at 240 hertz. So well, it's got that's assuming relative. that all tom toms are tuned yeah, the that's, same. That, that's well, relative. That's basically right. what you want to do is boost some very low end so that you've got some movement of the speaker, mm -hmm. and then you want to find the actual tone that the drum is tuned to, and increase that frequency to, to get the the tone of the drum. Especially in tom toms, where you're having a you know, dum 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 dum, -dum, -dum. Uh, you know, often tuned in fifths or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and you want to tune the actual note of the tom tom uh, boosted in the EQ. Mm -hmm. uh, 240 is a good place to start because uh, that kind of hits in the in in the middle. It, it, you know, that's the kind of the octave range that those fifths would be tuned in, but um, really, as we've said before, the chief uh, piece of test gear in the studio is your ears. Right. You know, Bart w w was absolutely expert at, you know, calibrating and making sure that what was coming out of the speakers is what was going into them. Mm -hmm. uh, that was going into the to the tape machine was what was coming out of the tape machine. But 
when it came to, to equalizing and stuff like that, you use your ears. Um, it's, did, did, uh, it, it, I, th I think it's a real mistake when engineers have a cheat sheet like right. what you're talking about. And they use and, it for every session. You know, all, trom <laughs> all trombones have this EQ and all basses have this EQ and all uh, uh, hi-hats have this EQ. Although there is a similarity, uh, you basically, uh, if, if they were all the same, you'd just have a button that you push that said, you know, this channel's being used for, uh, you know, tom-toms, this channel's being used for guitars, this channel's being used for vocals, and, and it would automatically appear, which has, in some cases, become the Pro Tools story of... Uh, easy engineering mm -hmm. well it, it yeah and um you and i've done this before together richard we've gone and eq'd and mic drums and all that but i i think i think the additional factor here and i was going to go back to the olivia newton john session is is how long was she out there and these days would a band or a singer i, I mean she was at the top so she's not a perfect example but time constraints so these guys just, I don't, you know, it's not like everybody was sitting around out at Indigo, but I imagine that the budget was for a much longer time to produce this record yeah. than might be in today's recording standards. Of course. Do you remember how long she was there, Bert? Um, I'm, I'm thinking it was a better part of a month. Yeah, which is a good recording budget. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, you're able to, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you're, you, you know, a month at Indigo, you could get a lot of work done. Well, did 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 who arranged? Because the arrangements on these tracks is fantastic. Who arranged it? John Farrar, or did, was there was there a musical director there too? I I don't recall a musical director. I think uh, it was John. Okay, because the arrangements were just like wow. This guy or whoever, you know, had, there's a little bit of everything. Well, I, th there. I think it was a combination of that and the musicians that he chose were all guys that uh, kind of self-arranged a lot of uh, stuff. You know, Michael Botts played the essentials on drums and wasn't drum solo crazy unless it needed a fill going into a, a chorus or something like that or into the bridge. Uh, same with the the guitars and the the synthesizers those guys were making hit records one after another and knew pretty much what to play uh, and you get somebody like uh, John Farrar saying well this is the kind of vibe we want on a record and you know we need space for Olivia to sing and we need uh, you know holes filled up at this point and this point uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, a, a little solo section here or a bridge section here. And uh, these guys were guys that didn't really need, you know, written out scripts. You know, when, when I listened back at this album <clears throat> uh, yesterday and then again today, I was kind of hoping that at some point I would hear that little roll in 303 that you have. <laughs> I've, been, I've been waiting to hear that thing. For anybody who doesn't know what a Rolling 303 is, it's kind of like the 80s. It wasn't, it wasn't was, on this album. I was no. going to say, I don't we, know if it's come we had, out yet. There, as I recall, there were a couple of really good bass players who each did a, a, a few songs. And uh, the, the, the 303 and the, the 808s and, you know, for drums and uh, stuff like that, um, really weren't necessary. Those were more kind of uh, part of the 80s sounds. Right, well, but, so it's right at the that, new wave type Or, or of later stuff, you know, where, where there was a lot of MIDI stuff happening and a lot of, uh, you know, tracks that were arranged to a grid. These were tracks that were played uh, to a feel. And, yeah. uh, I'll apologize because it didn't come out until 82. But I just, for yeah, some yeah, reason, yeah, I thought three right three. at the turn of the late, God, late I was 70s, right. early 80s, well, I just assumed somewhere in there I would hear it. I'm still trying to find a CD that you did that has it, though. 
well that that's what I go back to, especially on that first track is uh, there's an there, I, it doesn't sound like it was played. It sounds like it's an arpeggiator of some sorts that had a part, and it could have been. It's like if you remember on the first track again, it's called. Um, let me go through Please my notes. Don't here. keep me waiting. Please don't keep me yeah. waiting. And then there's this solo where it it almost sounds like a sax solo, but it's her voice. Yes, at the end, I heard that. Well, that, that you didn't have sampling back then, so but that was why I thought it might have been a vocoder. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was like, what, what's going on here when I heard that, too? Does anybody remember? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's just you and me. <laughs> you guys are both going, I, uh, I think she sang it. Oh, uh, that, that went through some kind of processing, though. You can well, hear it. It's one heck of a voice. Derek, do you have the album up there? Can you, we just even play that section, or? Um, I do, but... I don't know if we can share this with our uh, fans, so we might have, or uh, with the listeners, or the fans of uh, Olivia Newton-John. So um, we'll just we'll cut it here, and I'll come back when editing. Just thinking about that uh, song being uh, laid down, the vocals for that song. I recall Olivia on the outtakes, or while the the tape was being rewound, she would practice saying this phrase from that old movie called The Fly. And it was the fly on the wall going, help me. Only she was, help me, in her highest high-pitched voice. And uh, <laughs> the crack up. That's great. <laughs> so for, what, yeah. what? for anybody who doesn't know it, play that track back. Please don't keep me waiting. And you will hear the absolutely, the absolute creative and absurd thing we're talking about. Yeah, it's got this vocal part that it sounds like <laughs> no it No one else has re yeah, reproduced. <laughs> Manipulated, um, and in '78, how how common were synthesizers? Very, very, because yeah. I because for a person like me, they really took off in the '80s and they dominated almost the whole sound. Yep, new here it's yeah. here it's an accenting, you know, or an additional piece. Um, did um, did everybody get along during this session, or was there <laughs> headbutting? <laughs> Well, I, I, I could make a comment. It was an observation, and it wasn't about getting along or not getting along. It was more kind of an attitude uh, on behalf of the engineer and producer uh, toward Olivia when she was on the other side of the glass. Um, you know, it, they were making comments that, you know, I'd expect to hear like in a high school, you know, locker room or something. Oh, no. yeah. But, She's you know, it was... It was you know, and I was, you know, you know, 24, 25 or so and pretty impressionable. And here were these, you know, big time professionals just, you know, behaving like idiots. So it was, it was you right. Mean, you mean like lewd comments or? Uh, yeah, more or less. Yeah. Yeah, you could put it that way. And was that to have a psychological impact or were these guys just being those guys? The, the, the latter, yes. Okay. <laughs> that's, in, that's interesting. What Bart's saying is this wasn't something that was being broadcast through Olivia's headphones. Right. This oh. was, it was never supposed this, to this, leave the this studio. This was, was, was them, you know, oh chatting amongst themselves. I'm, some of my fondest memories of this whole album were sitting on the couch in the lobby just talking to Olivia. Yeah. Because she was like the most real person um, and... and not all hung up on herself and diva uh, struck or anything like that. You could talk to her about anything, uh, and uh, you were talking to a real person who was just, you know, w one of the prettiest, smartest, coolest people you've ever met. Well, and uh, I'll here say these guys are going on, you know, with, with, with the kind of stuff that Bart's talking about. Uh, <laughs> Uh, m in many ways, I think, not even recognizing who the artist that they had in front of them was. Yeah. Just another cog yeah. in the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of making hits. Okay. Well, yeah. celebrity, celebrity or not, we're all people, you know? Yeah. And yeah. You, you, can, you can be a nobody and still be a jerk. So it is nice to hear stories about <laughs> True. Celebrities, celebrities who have all this fame and all these, you know, people that love them, these fans, and 
stuff. It's nice to hear that they're just down to earth people like you and I that just appreciate a good thing and are actually interesting and fun to talk to. Well, I think no, that's she about. is, and we'll 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 do another uh, briefer podcast at some point when Olivia came back to Indigo uh, many years later to do an album, two thousand six ish, yeah, two thousand four, uh, four, yeah, and uh, how she uh, pressed the production staff that that's where she wanted to record. She had such fond memories of singing there and being there and all that kind of stuff that, uh, you know, she was in a position to say, this is where we're recording. And that's an album that was produced by Phil Ramone, mm -hmm. who you would think uh, uh, the all-powerful Phil Ramone is going to get his way, but nope, Olivia said, this is where we're recording. And then she even called me um, a year later wanting to do vocals for a Christmas album. Uh, but by that time, uh, we had pretty much disbanded the studio and I wasn't able to do it with her. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I regret to this day that, I, uh, that that album wasn't able to happen. She was just a wonderful person. I, I, I don't know how anybody could have had anything bad to say about her. Well, I, th I think that's the whole mysticism of the whole reality TV and people going behind the scenes because they want to know if, how real this person is. And in her case, she sounds to just be an extraordinarily nice person, um, despite her immense talent and success. And um, did did she ever I, say who who was her um, icons or or who she liked to, you know, where she found her singing from? Anybody growing up? Anybody that she liked? Did you get anything of that part? No, I, I, I just have no recall of uh, that kind of discussion. I would also yeah. add, you know, I, I was slightly intimidated by her just because, uh, you know, she was this, this gorgeous woman mm -hmm. uh, who was intelligent and so on. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, again, you know, I was in my early 20s, so <laughs> go figure. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Even... 30, some 30 years later, when she came back to Indigo, she was still this gorgeous woman. Yeah, yeah, she's you know, a beauty. She, yeah. she, she uh, took good care of herself, and uh, she still could sing like a little bird, and, uh, uh, you know, it's just a, a thrill and an opportunity for us to have been able to be a part of that. On, well, on that th note, did you notice anything different after 34 years? Um, did you notice anything different with her voice? Because, you know, as, as men get older, they tend to, their range tends to drop. Um, does, have you noticed anything like that with a female artist over time? Perfect example, her. Um, not really. Her, her, I'd say that when she was in her, you know, in her 20s, you know that her voice definitely was more in its prime, but she was singing much more difficult songs mm -hmm. uh, when she came back the second time. She was doing all covers of very difficult to sing songs and doing just an amazing job at it. Well, the the thing that I I, I sort of when I was um, doing some initial research about this and going on YouTube and watching videos and especially songs with this was that. A lot of the commentary from the public were that this woman was all class, you know, classy. She didn't even have to exploit her uh, sexiness, although I'm sure it was done as most, you know, as much as possible. But comparatively to to what some of the female artists are doing nowadays to attract your attention, she didn't have to do any of that, and was still a superstar, you know, and. Um, I was actually looking at some of the pictures of her online. I have it up on my computer right now. And you're right. There is a lot of great, like, profile in other right. shots. It's not just picture after picture of her in her bikini, you know. Yeah, twer twerking. I don't twer think you're going to see her twerking. twerking. Or however, no. yeah. But, um, so guys, <laughs> um, let's just kind of go back to the, the sessions. You have all these session guys coming and going. And you have, these produ you have this producer who is also a musician and a songwriter. Um, two of the songs were hits on this, this record. 
when were you guys around when they were recorded and was there a vibe that this is a hit was there a vibe that this one's different than the rest or did it just happen and you know what what's what's but bart or richard what's your take on that when for example deeper than the night for me when i hear that track track four you know after a lot of history but you can seriously go that song sounds very different than the first three tracks oh yeah and it was, of course, a hit. And then, of course, the other one being a, a little more love, they stand out. So when they were recorded, was there a vibe that we really got something here? Yeah, I, I remember a little more love being one of those things that, that just kind of came together. Whereas, you know, oftentimes, you know, a lot of the songs are just an immense amount of work, you know, like almost drudgery kind of work, you know. Yeah. Lots and lots and lots of takes, and that one, you know, if my memory is serving me at all, you know, far less number of takes, you know, and it just clicked. Uh, when you Bart, when you talk about lots and lots of takes, can you inform the viewers what that, what exactly that entails? I mean, if if you're an artist and you're a musician and you're at that level, and it's not happening, what what is lots and lots of takes? Well, you know, first of all, you have to. Re Remember back in those days, there's the the rewind time, you know, <laughs> so somebody, you know, messes up or the, you know, the producer decides that this just doesn't have the right feel, you know, he'll, he'll you know, have the engineer stop the machine, they'll rewind back to the top and, you know, give it another go. And, um, you know, that could be uh, 20 or 30 times on a, in a really, you know, difficult slogging it through session. Uh, not to say that doing it 20 or 30 times doesn't necessarily result in a good product. No, it's, you know, it can cut either way. But, uh, you know, my, my recall on this particular one, it was, you know. It had that freshness. That yeah, just a couple of takes. And then and then there's always the mix down, too, of, you know, how, how many, you know, embellishments, uh, you know, does one want to put on it, you know, and how many little overdubs uh, need to go on it. And... Uh, you know that's that's pretty variable. Do you guys recall where where if you were sitting around in the back of the control room or whatever, where she's like, "I just nailed that, awesome," and the producer was like, uh, "Let's do it again." So <laughs> was there a lot of that, or was it, or was everybody like, "Yeah, you did nail it," or Auto was tune. it? <laughs> oh, I I think you know what 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 I recall is I mean she worked hard, you know when she went out there, you know she you know didn't always get it the first take. You know, and sometimes it was her saying, no, that wasn't right. Sometimes it was a producer, you know, saying, no, that wasn't right. But, you know, she was real professional at, you know, just doggedly staying with it. Yep. For um, 20 or 30 takes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is one thing, like, we did Neil Young in a similar time frame um, with those sessions. He recorded their for several years always booking th the three nights of the full moon cycle and okay. uh, he would not do a song more than once if he didn't get it on the first take uh, if he was just doing acoustic guitar and vocal he'd move to another song if it was an already recorded song and we threw up you know and they'd come in with trunk fulls of two inch tapes you know like 200 songs to work on yeah. and, and you may only get to a few of them but they were there in, in case you needed them and we'd throw up a tape get a rough mix up on the board ready to overdub he'd go out there and if he didn't get what he wanted on the first take it was like switch tapes um, <laughs> so that everything was always first take fresh for that set of sessions and I think that's part of what Bart's getting at uh, on these hit songs that they they flowed together where it wasn't like pulling teeth to get a great track that you know everybody just went wow you know this is it yeah. and ag again in mix down of course you spend a little bit of extra time on what you know are the obvious hits of a record yeah. you you want yeah. them to to have all that sparkle and appeal that uh, is going to make them radio playable and uh, you know make people want to hear them over and over again. 
Uh, but I mean, you can listen to any song on that album and they all, you know, there, there's not any real awful, you know, Oh, let's throw that in as a B side. Mm-hmm. They're all Filler. good songs. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. but you can, you and can they, also. And they were all they were all given serious mix attention, and they were all given serious vocal attention. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't imagine an artist at her caliber putting any filler in on an album. Like no. there's so many people wrapped up in production and have money wrapped up in her and time. Why would you put Why would you have her, someone of that magnitude, put in any filler on the album at all? Which is why in those days, usually if we were doing a, a, a 10 or a 12 song album, you'd actually record 12 to 15 songs mm-hmm. and uh, it, it would work itself out by the time you got to the end as the couple of songs that didn't make it to the album. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I agree. I, I, I'm, not, Rather I'm, not than, saying, I'm not saying that you know, there were Nowadays were a band will force the issue of, you know, these are, these are the 12 songs that are going to be on the album and even if things are going poorly on a song, they'll they'll force that song to happen. Oftentimes, well, where where I was going is she is kind of like she's not a songwriter as much as she is the artist singing the song. Right. Yep. 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 So why this became ever... even more obvious when she came back thirty years later and did the Indigo Women a Song album. And I remember after the uh, album was recorded, you know, and Phil, the the Grammy-winning, amazing producer that he was, who's done every kind of music, and I remember him at times having his interest in a commercial for his Safeway Markets <laughs> that he was getting uh, emails of uh, you know uh, different versions and stuff and stuff like that. And Olivia being like ready to go, um, and she uh, she was just you know singing incredibly difficult songs, uh, and after the album was over and mixed, and she calls me up one day and she said, uh, Richard, I'd like to title the album Indigo. Would you have any objection? Nice. <laughs> exactly, Derek. I, you yeah, know, I was like. <laughs> no way. <laughs> what what big, what bigger compliment could you pay me? And I remember seeing her on one of the late night talk shows with a copy of the CD, and it you know says in you know big letters Indigo, and uh, what an honor it was to have had her choose that as the title of the album. Bart, were you there for those sessions at that time? Unfortunately, not. Okay, so hey, I, I, I was. Uh, I think I was in France then. How Bart, long were you Bart, Bart? at Indigo? Um, well, I, I think I, I arrived there at the end of 75, and I was full-time through 81, and then for the next, you know, N years, I was uh, essentially a consultant. I would get there a couple, three times a year and, uh, you know, basically help Fine Richard out. Tune with things or work on a specific project as we did updates or, or something like that, because really, the electronics which are, besides the great bands that we had, the electronics of Indigo were the sound, and that was basically uh, Bart, Dean, and Jerry Jensen, um, who put together this invincible uh, system. It wasn't just like we had a few pieces of equipment, like too many studios, you know, buy this and they plug it in and they have the rack next to the console. Everything was kind of systematized. That was one of Gene's, Dean's big objectives at the very beginning was to make the thing a system that all worked together and everything was matched impedance-wise and level-wise and uh, that was part of the, the secret to the sound was all the... Uh, the transformers and the level matching and Bart was a good part of the genius of that whole thing of getting things to work together. Well Bart, did you stay in the music business for years and years and years or was it a, a phase for you? or uh, A partial phase. I, I moved back to Minneapolis and was involved 
um, with a, a studio back there for a while, but uh, not in the, the extreme capacity that I was at Indigo. And then I, I did you work with the the artist formerly known as Prince back there? No, uh, on a studio. Uh, I, I, I thought I, I remembered coming out to Minneapolis and uh, going into a studio with you that he had some involvement in. Uh, he he did, but you know I never had any uh, association with him. But yes, yeah, he was one of the owners of uh, of the studio, right? And then yeah. you went to Hawaii to do uh, studio work uh, for uh, the Moody Blues Pinder. and Michael Pender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the last uh, twenty two plus years, I've been working for an electronic design consulting firm up here in Portland, Oregon. Oh wow! Okay. And uh, now now mostly just write software. Oh, wow. Notice notice the big collection of yeah, the I test gear above Bart's head. Calibration uh, and yeah. Bart he said you said basically France. put together the shop for Indigo and uh, you know defined uh, the characteristics and things that we needed to look for for the next thirty years and uh, you know how to test for them and simplified the you know, the process of keeping things running. And As really, a, there were only a few people in the business over the whole time that, I, and I knew a lot of guys who uh, tried to approximate that kind of job. There were really very select handful of guys who knew what they were doing. Both. Well, I, well, I was over at Westlake and, uh, and talking with um, the owner of that studio and Michael Jackson did Off the Wall there. I think he did Thriller there, too. I don't quite remember. Mm. But, but he was talking about the Harrison console there, and he said one of the, one of the tricks of that, that whole studio and why those records sound so great, not excusing any of the performances or the engineering or the production, yeah. Yeah. but was that Dean Jensen went through that Harrison console and, and it was no longer a Harrison. Yeah, he exactly. <laughs> he, had, he had tweaked that thing. Which is what he did at Indigo. On day one of Indigo, Michael Pender and I had uh, secured the property. We had knocked out a few walls to make a control room. We had the console on order. Um, originally, we were going to get an API, and then we were uh, wowed by the API offshoot, Angus. Mm -hmm. And the console arrives by truck, all crated up, hmm. pulls down the driveway, and a guy in an old Plymouth, I believe it was, black Plymouth, uh, pulls down the driveway, and, uh, you know, obvious uh, geeky guy gets out and uh, comes strutting up to the studio and is like, Hi, I, I'm Dean Jensen. I'm here to supervise the installation of the console. And Mike Pender and I looked at him like, "Oh, oh, thank you very much." But we <laughs> flew da we flew David Hawkins in from Scenic Sounds in London, and uh, you know we really don't you know thank you anyway. And uh, Dean said, "Well, you know, l let me stick around for you know just to make sure things are going good for the first day." And an hour later, Mike Pender and I were out in front of the studio uh, having a cup of tea, which was a thing that we commonly did on the, uh, uh, it was just an amazing view in front of the studio. And uh, David Hawkins comes walking out, and he had done all of the Moody Blues uh, sound systems in England, and it was like Europe's big studio designer guy. And we said, well, David, you know, what do you think about this Dean guy? Should we send him home? And he said, after an hour of working with Dean, he said, I feel like I should be out here on the front lawn with you guys soldering cords. Oh, my God. <laughs> he said, you know, keep this guy as long as you can. Wow. And then Dean took a love and interest in Indigo and actually built what became... Uh, Holiday Indigo, the uh, the musician's guest house, for his own personal use while he was up working on Indigo. He didn't even like it known that he knew how to solder or use tools because people would ask him to do it then. But he was the hands-on tech uh, until Bart came along and he was able to uh, 
Bart was a quick learn and was able to take over virtually everything that Dean normally did and you guys built up quite a friendship over the years and we you know Indigo was kind of like a family operation and you know Dean and Bart and Jerry Jensen were just part of the technical side of uh, of Indigo Ranch okay well let me let me pause here I'm gonna throw this question out um, I'm gonna mark the time uh, because yeah. it was was the 70s um, do you guys want to talk about drug use out there? Not particularly. No? Okay. Bart? No. Uh, no. You know, okay. rather not. There, right. there, there was drug use, you know, as can be expected. I would say that Indigo was probably less, even though there was drug use, I'd say Indigo was not like some of the famous Hollywood studios. Yeah. With where you went to get drugs. <laughs> well, the, the, the famous the famous '70s phrase is to have a mirror on the console, you know, and everybody knows what that's for. And um, I've I've heard of bowls of cocaine. That's the biggest yeah, thing I've you heard know, out here. And that we was, had we had sessions like that, and we had sessions that were uh, you know tea and organic food too. Okay. So or, it, or, or it, I I could I could even uh, make make another contrast here. Um, you know, two of them actually. One of them, you know, was as as Richards pointed out. You know, there were the uh, you know, the the druggy style sessions, and then there were the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, yes. style sessions oh, yeah. where there was no beer allowed in the refrigerator. You know, okay. And obviously, nothing nothing Who would that have been? in the direction of hard drugs. Uh, but then, even to go beyond that, we had an, a a client uh, who we didn't exactly know who it was. Uh, at first, they called and said they wanted to start the session at eight o'clock in the morning, and everybody was kind of like, "Huh, what?" <laughs> and, uh, so at, at eight o'clock, this van shows up and out pops all these these people, and they start going around the grounds and picking up, you know, all the uh, you know, like maybe some gum wrappers or a cigarette butt or whatever, and just you know, cleaned it immaculately, and then went into the studio, opened up their guitar cases, and pulled out these pictures of their guru, Maharaji. Right, of course, and, yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, an hour later, after they're all set up and running, the guru arrives with his entourage and walks into the studio, and all the musicians, you know, bow down, and Dennis, the engineer, is sitting there <laughs> looking around. Where did we go? <laughs> well, anyway. what, did it, was it like a spoken I, I know a album, little or? bit more to that story that, that I think was really funny. A number of women came in to clean up the kitchen and get rid of all signs, Bart mentions pick up cigarette butts, to get rid of all signs that there had ever been a cigarette even smoked there. And they were hiding ashtrays and stuff like that. And I remember saying to one of the girls, um, this Maharaji, the true leader and son of uh, God, uh, as you see him, isn't he going to know you did this? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, he's all, you're, he's all you're, you're trying to fool him into thinking that, you know, this and, and, and they were just like, they didn't even have an answer, answer like floored them. But the really funny joke out of his sessions, and we're probably not going to do a podcast on that one, yeah. was he came in and sat down at the console at one point and you know, was like, oh, how does this work and what does this do? And there were um, two, like, little miniature inch-and-a-half-long faders that controlled the echo sends. And he came in and he was pushing up on the uh, the echo send, and, and the joke of the session was, Maharaji used too much echo. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I, that's that also brings up a funny point, especially with the Neve and, and the SSL consoles. Is you have what is called fader swap. If you guys aren't familiar with that, and when the musician sits down and wants to tinker with the mix, you just quickly hit fader swap so that he's not getting what's you know not messing with what's going to be the final mix, so that he right. can just manipulate levels. And that kind of sounds like a little little similar to what the Maharaji was doing. Um, well, no, I. 
and we can either cut back in or just use all of that right there because um, not really growing up as an adult in the 70s, of course, learning about it uh, as, a, as a, and not, of course, being a, being a child and not an entertainment, drug use, you know, cocaine in particular, and then, of course, marijuana and all that. And a, a, an interesting point about that is a lot of those musicians and bands that were using it heavily um, did not last, and Olivia Newton-John did, so maybe she had a, a pretty clean lifestyle as well. That would be yeah. my guess. Yeah, I, I have no recall of her, you know, doing drugs there at all. Right, right. Yeah, right. Of any sort or, or right. any any intoxicant. Right. Um, well, because Richard, you had said, you know, 30 years later, she still looked great. She hadn't, she aged naturally and, and it wasn't any kind of pre-aging as the result of heavy drug use, you know. Right. Or or alcohol use or anything. She, she right. was just, you know, a, a real wonderful natural person. And, and then on that second album that she did, she brought up her daughter, Chloe, okay. who is not only as beautiful, uh, but an incredible vocal singer. Just, I gotta look her you up. know, yeah, absolutely incredible. And, uh, you know, there was, you know, family heritage following right in line, you know, beauty and, and, and talent. Right. Did she use a? Uh, I don't know. Do you know if Chloe uses Olivia Newton-John's last name or her husband's name? Or I don't know. let's. I'll just Google it. <laughs> let's see. Well, Bart, going name. back, going back to your oh. experience. So you you left Indigo and then you went on and did some other studio work. And was there a time where you just said, "I've had it with the music business" and went into computers and electronics full time? Um, it wasn't so much as you know having it with the. The music business. It was just me wanting to engage uh, more with uh, the uh, electronics world that I liked, which okay. was usually more design work. And um, I just, you know, found opportunities in other places uh, so to facilitate see, see, that. For Bart, uh, he was able to quickly know and understand virtually everything audio and that was just like a tiny compartment in his head of the, the electronics you're, world you're very and, complimentary and, well <laughs> I mean you're one of the few guys who really sees things in the way that you do as a complete system that's not just a, a bunch of resistors and transistors and uh, ICs strung together. You know how the whole system works and it, it, it interests you and uh, I, I think that uh, you dove into the studio electronics and mastered it and uh, it was time, time where you needed new input to keep you interested. Yeah, that, that's partially true. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity, you know, to come into Indigo and kind of work, uh, you know, in the shadow of Dean under his wing. I mean, it was it was truly incredible. Well, an interesting thing about it, Bart, is that, um, as Derek mentioned, um, there are now schools that are specifically uh, created to learn engineering and record production. And there you were at the top of the field, you know, right next to Richard and others, but you are dealing with the top artists where nowadays that's an incredible struggle for somebody even to get to that level. Yeah. And there, you know, and there, there you were already two years into it dealing with the tops of the industry. That's, that's fairly remarkable. But, um, I will say that the school I went to, um, wasn't just about, you know, wasn't just about music. We, we covered a lot of post as well as audiotronics. That was one of my favorite courses was actually, breaking things down, rebuilding things, you know, fixing tape machines, calibrating stuff, building cables. We did a lot of that too. And mm -hmm. I mean not obviously at uh, Bart's level, but it's it really it really allowed you to get on hand, you know, hands on and understand the gear that you really won't be using these days because it's all digital, but it was right. nice. It it was really nice though, you know. Yeah, well, at, we, at we had a number Go ahead, Bart. Oh, I was going to say, you know, at, at some point, though, um, 
they're you know aside from the digital technology you know that's essentially resident on a PC you know you still have cables between microphones and, and gear and you know just the craft of being able to be comfortable with a soldering iron you know and do quality work that's going to be reliable and so on that's that's a great great thing to know yeah and yeah. you know you probably got to know meter a little bit mm -hmm. you know which is again a very helpful tool you know when you're trying to you know sort out some problems so right. you know and, and yeah and just overall problem solving skills that well can I, I, I'll give you a, a brief story and then um, I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit further Bart but one I was I was in New York City and I was doing admissions for an audio engineering school and um, I didn't last there very long but um, and there's a there's a couple of reasons for that, but one of them was that a lot of the students came in that were potential candidates to be audio engineers, and it was um, why are you here? And their answer was I make beats. <laughs> now, I'm not I'm not insulting them or anything, but they came from <laughs> rap and hip hop, where you know their main thing because a lot of the top rap artists, a lot of top hip hop artists have people that's, that specifically make beats for them on a drum machine. Dude, that's and generational, I would say them, I'm sorry. <clears throat> that's I, generational would, because that's exactly what I would always hear. It would be like this in class. Hey man, what do you do? I play guitar. Yeah, what do you do? I'm a producer. Yeah, what do you produce? Some beats. Yeah. Some fat yeah, beats. You want to buy yeah. some fat beats? Nah, I'm yeah. cool. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, that was, that was the whole thing, which is why I probably didn't last at that school. I said, well, audio engineering is a lot of physics. It's wiring. It's learning to work with, like you guys are saying, you know, component level knowledge of how this gear works. And um, we've been criticized on the net for being a little bit too technical. But I, I think a fundamental part, if you're an engineer, is that maybe these days you don't need it because of the digital world. But Bart, you just touched on it, that if you're still good with a soldering iron, if you know what an ohm meter is, if you understand the physics of sound mm -hmm. and how it interacts with the equipment, you'll you probably not do to quick. electrocute yourself. Yeah, yeah it's, it's certainly not going to hurt you to, mm -hmm. to know that stuff. And it's just going to put you in a better position, uh, you know, in terms of microphone placement, uh, in terms of equalization. You're, you're going to be able to understand that stuff just so much better with, you know, the, the, the technical aspects of education. Um, there's a, you know, Richard might want to talk about Chris Brunt, who he ar already mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, who was, I, he was discovered by Bob Margulif, I believe, uh, in England, who, uh, I think he was doing Stevie Wonder sessions then. Wow. And oh, wow, yeah. Chris had, uh, I think, a, a master's degree in physics at, at some point and was um, working, I think he was the chief engineer at Polygram. And uh, before that, had been the chief engineer, I think, at uh, Goodman Loudspeakers. And Deutsch Gramophone. And, and, yeah, the, you know, the, the guy was smart, um, and he was one of the better engineers that uh, came through the door there. He was, I, if I was to say I had one mentor that I learned some of my engineering skills from, it would be Chris Brunt. I, I give him credit for almost everything that I learned uh, from another human being. There are a lot of things I discovered on my own, but in terms of him being what I considered the master, I had always said for, from day one up until the day indigo closed, was that if I could sing and I was doing an album, I'd hire Chris Brunt to do my engineering, even though I'm known as an engineer and a producer. He's the guy that I would have sitting in the chair if it was my music. Yep. Well, uh, that's, a, that's We a had a lot of great electronic guys working at Indigo. We had a, a, a string of the who's who, starting with Dean Jensen, Bart, Jerry Jensen, who was the chief guy at Capitol, we had for a few years Stephen Paul as our actual uh, uh, in-house, every day, all day, eight-hour-a-day technician of Stephen Paul microphones. Uh, 
we had Neil Pedinoff, we had, you know, just one good guy after another, but in terms of actually understanding the whole thing, I'd have to say that Bart and Dean were the two guys who really understood it. Chris Brunt understood it, but he was not going to be the studio tech uh, for any period of time because of his actual musical talents mm -hmm. were more uh, you know desirable for him to be working on the music than on the tech but he would be the third guy that I'd say really understood what was going on you know on a molecular level mm. um, like uh, Bart and Dean did. Bart, you, you were mentioning that you ended up in Florida, is that right, for a while? Uh, well, I, I just uh, was there last week. Oh yeah, how was that? For a couple of weeks. Well, everybody was uh, basically apologizing for the fact that the weather was only in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Wow. Yeah, that, that Florida Let California. me mention that this is January and uh, the, the people across the walkway from me just got back from Des Moines where they had a couple days where it got up into the teens, wow. but many days that were below zero. Uh, my wife and I just got back from Washington for the Christmas holidays where uh, there were days where it dropped below zero. So uh, you being in Florida during that same time cycle and people you know, having to apologize for it being as cold as the 60s has some real meaning. Yeah, that was good. But I, I assume we're offline now? No, we've been on the whole time. Oh, okay. Um, but we, we, can cut, we can cut that yeah, out. Can be I'm sorry, I wasn't, yeah. I was cross, crossing your... No, uh, no, no, you're fine. Go um, for it. That's what the, this is. Yeah, it, it, we, we'll edit it. Um, Bart, uh, advice for engineers? Audio engineers, you got any? You know, it, two pieces of advice you'd give an upcoming audio engineer. Well, that's that's those are uh, tough questions. I, um, from my standpoint, I guess uh, educate yourself as much as you can. You know, in as many different fields as you can. You know, because they everything all ends up tying together, and you know, and also just going from the you know, planting the seed standpoint, you know, so, so lots of seeds, you know, some of them will blossom into amazing things. Some of them may never grow, but you know, if you don't sow any, you aren't going to have any that grow. So that's, that's you know. a really nice, that's a really yeah. nice way. Yeah. Great analogy. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, um, we've gone on quite a bit on this one. This is Olivia Newton, John and totally hot. Um, let's just kind of, um, talk about, uh, what you and Richard took away from those sessions after it was all finished? Well, um, first of all, you know, as I had mentioned, you know, briefly, just at you know, at a at a personal level, um, I, I felt a little uh, more mature. I think, especially <laughs> to the, the engineer and producer, uh, I I also felt like uh, I had uh, been run through the ringer. Physically, just because of having to stay on top of, you know, those two 24-track machines. Um, and they tended to work long hours on that session, as I recall. So it, it, it was truly demanding. And uh, there, there was, I'm going to just do an aside here. There was a, a situation where um, the synchronizer, the eco, broke down. And there were no spares to be found anywhere east coast or west coast and so I took the unit down to eco headquarters early one morning hopped on the freeway down to Orange County and uh, got in to see you know the the, the head of um, you know uh, service and you know he kind of shook his head and so uh, while we don't give much help being able to fix this you know when you open it up and it's just Full of you know TTL logic, you know probably 50 chips on the board. Oh wow! And no microcontrollers back then. And yeah. uh, but you know he had a really good attitude. He said, "Well, we'll just start at the top." And you know he spent like five minutes on it, and he found a bad gate. 
Um, I think Which is a chip. Four, yeah, yeah. An IC four, chip. Four, yep. Uh, well, even, even further back, Richard, a synchronizer, what he's mentioning is so that the two tape machines would speak to each other in sync. So anyway. That's correct. Yeah. Right. And so uh, he replaced that uh, IC or chip, and uh, he didn't have a full means to test it. He, you know, it, it had a... a you know, a small diagnostic that it could run, but it was very limited. And uh, he said, "Well, I think it'll work." So I just took it on faith, and you know, drove the 50 miles back up to Indigo. And wow, sure it, it was. But there was yeah. it was a lot of pressure on there too because yeah. of not being a replacement, and uh, you know, session must go on. Yeah, synchronizing was always uh, a challenge, uh, especially in the early days before. Lynx, right. uh, the, the company Lynx mm -hmm. came along, and even then it was still a challenge. It, anytime you had to sync up a bunch of machines, there were bound to be inf more problems than you would ever see with well, just one machine. What was the other one? Cooper Audio, I think, or was it Audio Cooper was another main sync um, company, if I remember correctly, but that, that's going way back. I can't remember. Yeah, I don't think they were on the horizon at that point in time. Do you recall them, Richard? I don't recall them. J.L. Cooper, that's it. I remember the J. name. J.L. Cooper, I remember the name, but I don't yeah. think that audio syncing was ever brought into Indigo with their... With their name on it? Brand name on it. I remember the first album that I had to sync up was um, with a, a API synchronizer that did not use uh, SEMPTI but had its own proprietary time code and uh, again it was one of those things where you had to rewind both machines separately uh, then you had to get very close to the starting point or it would never sync up and uh, it, it was just hours and hours of extra work and we used that at uh, um, when we were mixing uh, the album uh, for David Palmer, the, the Great Waku, and uh, mm -hmm. that it was a wonderful album. That from Steely Dan. David Palmer was the lead singer on the first Steely Dan album. Right, right, right. And uh, it was a wonderful album, but uh, the record company got in a fight with the production company and never really promoted it, but I still consider that one of the half dozen best albums I ever worked on. Uh, what is your What is your takeaway from the Olivia Newton John Totally Hot uh, session, Richard? Um, I think it was really the uh, uh, the experience of working with her and uh, seeing the. Every woman superstar that I have ever worked with is different than her. And seeing that you can have a woman of her caliber and stardom who was just a plain old nice hometown chatty girl uh, that had incredible talents but was moreover a human being. And I think I learned a lot about life from her. Okay. Um, Derek, any comments or thoughts? Oh, I'm just uh, taking a minute to look up that David Palmer album. What What was the title of that one? Why uh, I, I think the title was Silken Chains. Silken Chains? Yeah. Yeah, and the group was Waku. Waku, I think it's W-A-I. W-A-K-O-O, -A -O -O, oh, I believe. Yeah. Um, well, uh, that about wraps it up. Unless anybody has any thoughts or comments they'd like to add. Bart, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you, uh, Bart. Oh, thanks uh, for the invite. It's been great. Really. And uh, we'll, uh, 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 as, as this goes through and we plow through uh, some of these early memory chain things, uh, <laughs> I'm sure we'll be seeing you again, if you will. Let me uh, finish with a couple of bits of business. Uh, thank you again, Bart, for joining us. Um, 
this podcast, uh, we release most all of our podcasts on Monday, and it will be available on um, youtube.com forward slash Studio Rat HQ. Uh, you can also hear the audio if, if you want to just hear it and download it for yourself. That is available at Studio Rat HQ.com. And we also have Facebook pages, Studio Rat HQ, Facebook.com forward slash Studio Rat HQ, and RIP Indigo Ranch. Um, and please, uh, you, you know, we like we said, we've been taking in your advice. There have been some requests for um, how-to videos, how to do things, how to um, particularly uh, particular aspects of engineering or whatever. And we're in the process of increasing those. There are a few on the YouTube channel. If you if you creep around there, you'll find that we have a few um, drum miking how-tos, guitar amp miking how-tos. But we're going to be uh, doing more of that as well. So um, from me, Stephen Couch, and Derek Jablonski, Richard Kaplan, and Bart Johnson, we'd like to say thank you for listening. Uh, and as, as we always say, same rat time, same rat channel next week. And we will talk to you again. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.